Good morning. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome each of you to our Sunday morning worship service. Sounds like everybody's having a good time this morning and everybody's got a smile on their face and it's all good. So welcome everyone. If you are visiting with us, we are honored to have you and we invite you to come back at any opportunity that you have. We would ask that our members as well as our visitors uh, take an attendance card located on the back of the pew in front of you and uh, please fill these out and pass them down to the outside aisle and they'll be picked up in a few minutes. On our prayer request, uh, Joanne Hayes uh, has COVID. Uh, John, I'll probably butcher this last name, D. Gar Alamo is the father of uh, Sheila Lennon, is battling cancer and uh, COPD. And then also remember Addison Onan, uh, she's been in the hospital for observation for seizures, and they're trying to figure out what's causing the seizures. So please remember all these in your prayers. In other activities, uh, our young men will be leading our services this evening, so please plan to be here and uh, encourage them. The October King's Copy is available in the lobby. The uh, Women of Worth group and uh, any seniors who would like to go will be going to lunch at the Adams Breezy Hill Farm restaurant in Princeton, Kentucky on Saturday. You will leave the building at 10 a.m. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby and please see Juan Nunez or Brad Carter if you have any questions. Our Wednesday night meal on October the 4th will be catered by Agave's. Please sign up in the lobby today if you plan to attend. The cost is $4 per person. Our annual uh, Frosty Pumpkin Dinner will be October the 7th in the Fellowship Hall. This is for uh, our members who are 60 and over. This will be hosted by our youth group. There's a sign up sheet in the lobby if you plan to attend this night of fun fellowship and delicious food. Please see Josh Terry if you have any questions or if you need a ride. Our trunk or treat will be different this year. Uh, this event will be October the 14th from 4 to 6 p.m. in the church parking lot. This is for our kids as well as being an outreach event to our community. There's a sign up sheet in the lobby for those decorating their trunks and giving out candy. Please mark your calendars uh, for the annual fall festival. It will be October the 21st at 6 p.m. at the McIndoo Cabin, and this is a church-wide event. That's all I have in the way of announcements. Uh, those privileged to lead us this morning, our opening prayer will be by David Arthur. Our song leader is Carl Powers. Our Lord's Supper Devo will be by Josh Terry. Reading our scripture will be Bill Bridwell. Our sermon by David Salisbury and our closing prayer by Scott Shue. That's all I have. Now, if you would, join Carl in her singing.
Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this beautiful morning you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity to, to be here and to spend time with fellow Christians and worship you. We pray that we can uh, set our minds on the purpose we have here, and that is, is to worship you, to, to sing songs to you, to learn about you, to, to pray to you. We just are here to, to honor the gifts that you've given us and honor the, the blessings we have because of you. We pray that you'll be with us and uh, help us set our minds uh, to the appropriate thing and just bless us as, as we're here to worship you this morning. We pray for those who are unable to be here, that you can uh, comfort them, that you can guide and direct them, and that we can be supporters of them in their walk. We thank you for the gifts we have. We thank you for the, the gift of the people that are here today, and we, we thank you most of all for the gift of Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.
Now, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We read these words a lot whenever we're talking about the Lord's Supper. Uh, as a, This is the institution of the Lord's Supper, and there's nothing wrong with that. And this helps us to remember. But I want to go and look at some of the things that Jesus went through on that night. Uh, Jesus was first betrayed by Judas. He was then arrested, abandoned by his disciples, falsely accused by people he was coming to die for. He was spit on, slapped, whipped and beaten, humiliated, stripped naked, mocked, forced to carry the cross, and then finally crucified. All these things, there was immense pain, emotional and physical, that he went through. But that pain wasn't due to him. He didn't deserve that pain. Instead, that was our pain, the pain that we deserved because we our sinful creatures. And it is through his blood that we are made new. And so as we partake of this bread, let us go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this time where we can come together to remember the sacrifice, uh, the giving of your son. And as his body was hung upon that cross, we pray that we partake of this bread in a meaningful way uh, to, to us Christians that it represents that body. Lord, we ask that we do so in a manner that's pleasing in your sight. It's in your son's name. Amen. Let's have a prayer for the cup. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the fact that you were willing to, to care about us, to love us enough to send your son. Uh, we ask that as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which to us Christians represents your son's blood that was shed on that cross at Calvary, uh, that continuously washes over us, we pray that we partake of this in a manner that's pleasing unto your sight. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.
separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we now have the opportunity to give back to the many works that happen here at the, the church. And so uh, let's have a prayer for our offering. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the fact that you love us and you have uh, given us these opportunities to work for you, Lord. And we pray that um, in our many jobs and our activities, uh, that as we give back, that it can benefit the growth of your church to spreading your word throughout the, the world. We're so grateful for the fact that you love us and the fact that you sent your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
Bible reading this morning comes from Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for being here this morning. It's been a, a great weekend. We've had a, a great worship time already. I know we've got several visitors with us. I, I can see that, and we appreciate you being with us. You honor us with your presence today. I've had a, a busy weekend already. I shared in Bible class. I, I was able to speak at a teen retreat up at, at Camp Wabashi in Terre Haute, Indiana. Enjoyed being there with them this weekend. Got in last night. I am headed to the Harding Lectures this afternoon, so uh, tonight when, when the young men lead the worship service, I, I need you to be here and encourage them. I know you're going to do that anyway, but I am excited to do that, and I'll be listening online tonight to them leading the service. I, I'm looking forward to that. By the way, while I was up in Terre Haute, I do bring you greetings from Seth and Jessica Woodison. That's where they are now, and, and they certainly remember their time here very fondly, and so many of you and, and wanted me to send those greetings. We've been talking on Sunday mornings, though, about being outside the box. We, we've said there's lots of things about faith and, and church and the Bible and God that we try to box up. We try to get a handle on it, try to contain it in some way. And, and we often try to put them into little neat categories that we can manage, that are easy for us to, to handle. But you can't put God in a box, and you can't put his plan in a box. When C.S. Lewis wrote his stories of Narnia and tells the, the story of Christianity and in an allegory there. And in his, in his books, Aslan the lion represents God. And over and over again, people who know Aslan say, you got to remember, Aslan is not a tame lion. You don't control him. You don't manipulate him. God is bigger than any box we could ever create for him. And of all the topics we'll look at in this series that are outside the box, perhaps none is bigger and more obvious than this one we'll look at today. Perhaps nothing about God is more, or refuses to be boxed up more than the grace of God. Maybe you know the definition of grace. It's getting something that you don't deserve. It's unmerited favor. But grace is at once both the crown jewel of Christianity, but also a difficult concept for us to really understand. Because we keep trying to find some way to, to box it up, some way to get a handle on it, to explain it. We, we put terms and conditions on it. We put a little asterisk by it, and there's some small print at the bottom. It's what we keep trying to do to grace because we want to be able to explain it. And there's part of it that doesn't make sense to us. And, and I want you to experience grace in fact, this illustration is, is not uh, new or original with me, but the best example I know of is I've got a $20 bill here, and, and it's free to the first person who doesn't run and doesn't hurt anybody on the way down here. It, it's yours if you want it. It seems too good to be true. Is there anybody else? <laughs> It's free to the first person, I'm telling you. I hope you experience grace in your life. I hope there's times you're like, wow, I didn't deserve that. Enjoy lunch today. Josh and Emily are going out to lunch now. But they got to eat cheap. I hope you experience grace. But if you try to understand grace, if you try to really wrap your head around it like, hey, wait a minute. You have to go all the way back to the beginning. Actually, to understand God's grace, you have to go back before the beginning. I want you to imagine for a moment having no obligations at all. Now, when we go on vacation, we turn loose of a lot of our obligations. And if you turn your phone off while you go on vacation, you turn loose of even more of your obligations. But there's still part of you that's worried about and how are we going to. But what if you had a time where there were no obligations at all and it wasn't just no obligations for a week or two weeks. It's no obligations forever. You don't owe anybody anything. There's no expectations, no obligations. What would you be? You would be God. Grace begins with the knowledge that God is not obligated at all. He doesn't owe anyone anything. Nobody ever forced God to do anything that he didn't want to do. The book of Genesis is not a, a science book to explain how creation happened. The book of Genesis 
is a theology book to explain to us who created and why. And so it says, in the beginning, God created. And we should stop right there and say, why? Why did God create? He created heaven and earth. Why did he do that? Nobody made it. He didn't have to. He was under no obligation at all, and he freely chose to create. And the story of creation goes on in verse 2 and says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, Let there be light. He didn't have to do that. But he said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Did God, was he obligated to give us light? No, he created the earth, but he didn't have to give light. In fact, we barely notice the light. We take it such for granted that the sun comes up, that, that there is light in the darkness whenever we want it. But light is only here because God chose to give light. And that's kind of like God's grace. God gives so much more. It goes unnoticed and unappreciated, and yet we can't imagine life without it. Life without light would be utter darkness. Life without grace would be utter darkness. Was God obligated? Did he have to do what he did? No. And notice, if you read in creation, he created the heavens and the earth. He created light, and he just kept on creating. So much more. He goes on and on and on. And finally, on day six, he creates man. Let us make man in the image, in our image. He didn't have to do that. Imagine if he said, you know, I really like the slugs. Let's make man in the image of the slugs. Let's make man in the image of, take your pick. But he says, let's make man in our image. Can you imagine that? Stop to think about what God chose to do. To say, I'll put my image on mankind and he didn't stop there amazing thing happened next God says I'm going to make man God says I'm going to make man in our image and then God blessed them wait a minute after all he's created Eden he's created perfection he's created man and then then he blessed them after he did all of that He still blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God blessed them after he had done all of that. He wasn't done. Reminds me of what Paul says in Romans 8 and verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So in creation, did God do the bare minimum? No, his grace went above and beyond. He wasn't obligated to do anything, and yet he did everything. When it comes to our salvation, all you and I needed was the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus died on the cross and so forgave our sins. God could have stopped there. It's all we needed, but he didn't. He freely gave us all things. That's the grace of God. Go back to Genesis. And God said, see, I've given you every herb of the yield seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, and it shall be to you for food. Now, we can talk about the, the diet that God had in store, and fruit and trees, and, and, and it's wonderful. But I want you to notice something. In fact, if you underline verses in your Bible, here in Genesis 1 and verse 29, would you underline the very first recorded words that God speaks to man? The first thing God says, I have given. It's his first words to man. I have given. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. It's not that you're so special. I I had to do this. I'm under no obligation. But I have given. I don't owe anybody anything. But I have given. And what did mankind do with the beautiful blessings that God had given? We wrecked it. We broke it. We messed it all up. We lost Eden. 
In Genesis 3, you had one job. God made this perfect creation. He made this perfect garden. He put you in charge of it. He said, you got one rule. And they couldn't even keep one rule. So what do you do? When you have freely chosen to create, when under no obligation of your own, you have given everything. And these folks didn't appreciate it. And they broke it. What do you do when you show grace and it's not appreciated and you're not obligated to do anything? Well, God could have killed them there, right there and then. He said, in the day you eat of it, you'll die. He could have punished them. That's it. I showed you grace and you blew it. He'd have been justified. The law says you reap what you sow. But God intervened instead. He covered their shame. He redeemed even though he wasn't under any obligation to do so. Why? Because it was his grace. Why? Why would you do that? Because he wanted to. Because he freely chose to redeem. Adam and Eve are punished but not killed. They're disciplined but not disqualified. The New Testament really is Genesis 1 through 3. God gave. We messed it up. God redeemed. Did he have to create a new creation? No. Did he have to take our chaos and breathe new life into it? No. He didn't have to. He didn't have to look into the, our darkness and say, let there be light. Let the light of the gospel shine in your life. But he gives us order and purpose and potential in Jesus Christ that he didn't have to. He's not obligated. He's not obligated to give us anything, let alone everything. But he chooses to give and to redeem. He who did not spare his own son, will he not also give us all things? He's given us all things. Peter says all things for life and godliness. He didn't have to do that. Did he have to intervene in our situation to cover our shame? No, he could have left us in the mess we made to pay what we deserved. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. He who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. He did that for us. Romans 8, verse 28, God says, I work in all things for the good of my people. I work in all situations. Does he have to? No, but it's his grace to redeem. The God of the garden is the God of Golgotha. The, the God who created and gave everything perfectly to us in Eden is the God who gives up everything on the cross. He is active and he's involved in our world today. And we're left with one question. God, why would you do that? Why would you continue to show grace over and over again when it's broken, when it's not, when it's not appreciated, when it's not obeyed and followed? Why would you continue to redeem? Because he wants to you got to get that before you'll ever understand grace. He chooses to, purely because he wants to. God, who was never, ever, under any obligation whatsoever to give or be forced to owe anything to anyone, willingly obligates himself to people. Because, you see, now God is obligated because he obligated himself. Once he promises... He's going to keep his promise. Nobody made him, but he chooses to enter into that covenant relationship. And we could keep looking. We looked at Adam and Eve, but you could go look at Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, the world has gotten so bad, the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth. His heart, and he was grieved in his heart. But skip down to verse 8. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Man had messed up so bad that God was sorry for creation. It breaks his heart so much that he is grieved in his heart. But as he looks down, he says, but there's one good guy. There's one guy who's doing everything right. There's one guy who deserves my blessing. So I will give him what he's earned. Is that what it says? Noah didn't find a paycheck for his holy service to God. Noah found grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In fact, in the Bible, frequently when you want to find the word grace, it's spelled with that very first word of verse 8, but. Here's what was going to happen, but. Here's where everything was headed, but. In fact, every time you see the words, but God, but God did, but God said, but God in his, 
just underline that right away. When God says, here's where everything was going, but I will take action, but I will say, but I will do, that little three-letter word is a word that means deliverance. It's a word that means hope. It's a word that means things aren't quite as hopeless as we thought. Pay close attention because grace is on display. Grace is for the good. You find good people who need grace. The Tower of Babel shows us good people. They're good at what they do. They're well-skilled. They come together. They work and they do incredible things. They're good, but they need grace. Abraham. Abraham's a mess. We call him the father of the faithful, but you read his life and he messed up a lot. He's a scaredy cat. He lies. He lies about his wife, not once, but twice. He lies about his wife in such a way that he almost allows her to be married by someone else. He tries to force God's hand. God, if this is your plan, we're going to do it my way. But grace is not about performance. It's not about God's plan. Grace is for the good, but grace is also for the wicked. Grace is for the folks who are in power. You can't have enough power to not need grace. And grace is for the broken. Grace is for everyone. You go through and you see the Tower of Babel. You see Abraham. You go on and you see Moses. He's a man with God's fingerprints all over his life. Literally from birth, as a baby in the basket, people looked at him and said, God's got something special in store for him. And they could see it. And I don't know what it was, but people who saw baby Moses said, there's something unique about this child from the moment he was born. At the Red Sea, Moses experienced grace. As the waters of the Red Sea close over the Egyptian army who was chasing them through, as God killed the entire Egyptian army that was coming after his people to kill them, he says, Moses, I just buried your enemies and I just buried your past too. The one who demanded that all the baby boys be drowned in the Nile River just had all of his soldiers drowned in the Red Sea by the power of God. Moses, let's go forward together. What are you standing here for, Moses? Let's go and God proceeds to lead. You can see the fingerprints of God all over these stories. Grace is for everyone. The good and the wicked, the, the, the powerful and the broken. Wherever you see yourself, you can't be good enough. You can't be powerful enough that you don't need grace. And you can't be so wicked and so broken that grace can't redeem you. Everyone needs grace. And if you told your story right now, hey, if we could stop and you could just say, hey, here's what, here's what led me here today. Here's what brought me to church this morning. Here's what's going on in my life. You would see the fingerprints of God's grace all over your life. You're not here by accident. It's not a coincidence. You're here because God's grace is active in your life. In times of slavery or suffering or desperation, in times of brokenness and loss, he is not absent. And as you read through the Old Testament, you see God's people going through all of those things. In the desert, he is the God who provides. When we run, he chases. That offer is still the same. Be free of your past. Be free of your enemies. Find grace. You see it all through the Bible. And so if we want to know what is grace, we've looked at it. If we want to say why is grace, well, we've looked at it. But what do I do with grace? Well, so many times we try to fit it in a box. We say that story's just too good to be true. The only way I can really wrap my mind around it is to, to box it up. But you have to break it to box it. You have to say, here's a little piece of grace. Now, I, I can understand a little bit of grace. You have to mess it up. Say, well, here's the, some terms and conditions. It's grace if, it's grace when, it's grace after, it's grace for. You put a little bit of works in there, a little bit of merit. Grace is yours. It's a free gift, but as seen on TV. It's yours free, just pay $19.95 shipping and handling. It's yours free, asterisk, buy one, get one free. And that's what we do with God's grace. It sounds so good, to, they're too good to be true, and so we figure there's gotta be a catch. And so we add a little bit to it till it makes sense to us. And Paul talks to the Galatians and he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ. 
You were called in grace. Grace was preached to you. You heard the grace of God. You were called in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. When you add something to it, when you put a little asterisk beside it, when you put some terms and conditions on there, it's no longer the gospel. And you have turned away. The word there is literally the word, you're a deserter now. You've become a traitor to the grace of God. If you try to box up little pieces of it and sell that as the whole thing, you can't do it. It's not another gospel. Because there is no other gospel. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. It's not another gospel. It's a twisting of the truth. Grace isn't grace if you have to modify it. And what you get might look like grace, but it's not. Now, the struggle in Galatia that they were dealing with was folks who said, well, go look in the Old Testament. and There's some Jewish rules and regulations that you need to follow in order to enjoy all the grace of God. Uh, There's some circumcision there, so now it's the gospel plus surgery. Uh, There's some things you need to do, and it's, it's easy for us to do that as well, though. It's easy for us to add to grace. Somebody comes and says, hey, I want to be a Christian. Great. Boy, we would love to have you be a Christian. That's fantastic. So what you need to do is quit all your drinking and your cussing and your smoking and your dipping and your dirty jokes and your porn habit and all your other addictions and stop wearing those immoral clothes and cover up all your tattoos and jerk those piercings out. You need to look like us and sound like us and agree with us on everything. And when you get all that done, come back to us and we'll be happy to tell you about the gospel. And if people get that idea that somehow we've communicated that to them, if we've told them, clean your life up and then we'll tell you about the gospel, clean your life up and after you've done all the hard work, grace will wash the last little bit away. That's not the gospel. We've perverted the gospel to something that it's not. Paul would say, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, Let him be a curse. That word is as harsh a word as Paul can use. Let him go straight to hell. Let him be condemned. That's how God views changing the gospel. As we've said before, verse 9, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Paul says for people who say it's grace plus, grace and, grace with an asterisk, grace with terms and conditions that apply, grace with offer may vary, Prices may vary in Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. Grace with, let him be accursed. If you take the grace of God and say, that sounds good, but God, let me, let me modify it a little bit. And whether we do that to somebody else or do it in our own life and say, God, I, I, know, I know you have grace, but I'm going to work really hard because I think I have to. We've twisted the grace of God. When you add something to grace, you kill it. When you box it, you break it. Grace is given regardless of anything we have done. Anyone can come to Christ while grace is offered. Now we talked about Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And it was all grace because God then comes to Noah and he says, Noah, I'm going to tell you what's about to happen. Was he obligated to do that? No, but Noah, there's going to be a flood. It's going to be bad. And Noah, you're going to need a boat. And Noah says, what's a boat? And he says, I'll tell you. And it's a really big one. So here's the plans for it. Did he have to give Noah the plans for the ark? No. And Noah, I'm going to give you a hundred years to get it built. Did he have to give Noah that much time? No. But God, in his grace, freely chose to tell Noah everything he needed. And a hundred years of work. And then, Noah, and then God shuts the door to the ark. And it's the day of the Lord. That's what it's described as. It's the day of the Lord and rain begins to fall. And the water begins to rise. And Noah and his family and the animals are safe inside the ark, but they can hear the folks outside. They can hear the folks, let us in, let us in. And maybe Noah would even say, boy, I want you to get in. Come on, let me find a way. But grace wasn't Noah's to dispense. It was God's. And he had said, you had to be in the ark When the day of the Lord came in order to be saved, when God shut the door and they'd had a chance to obey beforehand, the time had passed and you have to believe Noah's heart broke as he knew the folks that were out there. But maybe that makes us understand what Peter was feeling. 
When Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, the Lord's not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God, why are you waiting on the day of the Lord? Why are you waiting on judgment day? I'm being patient. I want one more person. I want one more person to hear the gospel one more time to have that opportunity. What if, what if you're the holdup? What if grace is free and it'll save you, but you're waiting? And God says, I, I want to wait just a little longer. What are you waiting for? Because the day of the Lord will come. Peter says it's going to happen. The door will be closed. The rain will fall. The day of the Lord will come. But today the door of salvation stands open. Today the gospel is preached and shared. And understand, obeying the gospel is not about what are you going to do. It's about what do you believe. Because if you really believe that there's a day of judgment coming, that there's an accountability coming. You see, Noah believed and Noah got busy. He didn't build an ark because, well, I just feel like building a boat. He believed what God said and so he acted. What he did came from what he believed. And those around Noah, they didn't believe. And so they did nothing. Do you believe it's going to rain? Do you believe a day of the Lord is coming? Do you believe there's a judgment time that God is going to ask us about the choices we've made that we'll have to give an account? Because if you believe that, then you'll act. If you believe in God who created and started everything by grace because he chose to, but also says there's an ending day, there's a time coming. And by grace, he offers salvation. You can't earn it, you can't pay for it, you can't deserve it. But when faith motivates you to respond, you sure can receive it. What are you waiting for? God's grace is amazing grace. And his grace reaches even to me and even to you. In a moment, we'll sing an invitation song. Deeper than the ocean, higher than the mountains, brighter than the suns. Though my sins were as scarlet, he washed them away. That's grace. But don't take advantage of it. Don't think you can play the system and wait. Because when I tell you that I've got a $20 bill and it's free to anybody that wants it, it's here. If you want it, you can come get it. It's available. There you go. You're welcome. Notice he's a little quicker this time. I saw him check Josh too. He's like, am I going to have to hip check Josh on the way? He believed that offer because, hey, I saw it change somebody else's life. Jesus, it'll change mine too. I saw grace in somebody else and now I believe it. I've seen it. In fact, when I held that 20, I was like, hey, I know what he's fixing to do, right? And you knew what I was going to do. Because when you've seen grace, you begin to understand how it works. Let me ask you, if you got a snake bite, and you knew that it would kill you, and you had the antidote in your hand, how long would you wait to take it? Would you say, I want to see how close I can get to death. I want to see if I can almost die and then pop it in at the last second. Would you do that? Would you say, well, you know, I just want to feel the poison for a few more minutes. And then how long would you wait if you knew that you'd been snake bit and you had the antidote in your hand? You see, that's how scripture talks about being saved. That's how scripture talks about our decision. It's not about being good or getting better. If you knew you'd been snake bit, you wouldn't say, well, you know what? I need to clean up this mess a little bit and I, I've got a few things to fix and then I'll get around to the antidote. You'd say, I gotta do that first. Scripture speaks about salvation as a matter of light and darkness, as a matter of life and death, clean and unclean, a solid foundation versus a shaky one that will let you down. Scripture says grace is amazing, but don't play around with it. Don't take advantage of the offer and say, oh, I'll, I'll wait. Don't box it up and say, I'll get back to that one day. Grace is worth way more than $20. Grace is your soul. Grace is your eternal life. It won't just make your life a little bit better. It won't just buy you a free lunch. It'll save your soul. And if $20 would motivate you, to say, hey, I'll come take advantage of what the preacher's talking about. For 20 bucks, I'd do that. What would you do if God says, I offer grace right now? 
Would you become a Christian? Would you repent of your sins and confess your faith in Jesus, be baptized to have those sins washed away, to have your soul saved? Would you do that for an offer of grace? Because it's available. And if you're a child of God, you proclaimed that faith, but you've turned your back on it. You've walked away from it. And today God says, I offer grace. Would you come back? Would you repent and return? Would you be restored? It's a crazy, outside-the-box grace. And it's available. What are you waiting for? If you need to come to the Lord, won't you come right now as we stand and sing? Jessica Johnson comes this morning. Jessica and her family have been visiting with us for a few weeks, and we've been talking some. And this morning, she just says, I don't want to wait anymore. She said, I, I want to be, she said, I need to be back in church. I, I need to be restored and renewed. And Jessica and I are going to do some Bible study together and, and talk some more. But she said, I want this morning for the church to pray for me. She said, I, I want to be right with God, and we certainly want to honor that request. It's our privilege to pray for her. Would you bow with me as we offer this prayer? Father God, we are humbled by your grace that you freely offer us. Thank you for Jessica and her example today of a desire simply to say, I want that. Whatever it takes, I want that. Whatever I need to do, I, I want that. And God, we thank you that your offer is freely made. And we pray that your grace would surround her, that you would forgive her sins. And God, we pray as she walks with you and comes back to you, that you would guide her steps and give her wisdom. Thank you for, our, for this church. And we pray that we would surround her that she could walk with us to know that she's not alone in this journey. And God, we're grateful for our church family and the grace that you have shown each and every one of us. We pray that you would guide us in wisdom to grow closer to you each day. Thank you most of all for the forgiveness and the fresh start that you promise each of us. Help us, Father, to walk in the light of your grace each day. In Jesus' name, amen.
Please bow with me. Father, we're so thankful that you've given this opportunity to come together this morning and sing songs to you of praise and hear a portion of your word. Father, we're so thankful for the lesson that David prepared for us this morning. We, we pray that we will take it and apply it to our lives, and we pray that we will wrap our heads around what God has done for us in giving us the grace that he provides for us. Father, we know that we don't deserve it, and we pray that we will just take it and, and use it to make us better Christians for you and, and show others in the world what your grace can do for us. And mostly in your son's name we pray. Amen.